Good evening, everyone. Job32 Elihu. Welcome to the channel. Boy, have I got a message to you. This is about sexual immorality and the effects on our society. Believe it or not, you have no idea how deep this goes. Stay tuned because you are going to have your eyes opened and uh, to our ungodliness, really, um, in light of God's word, hopefully. Listen, um, please subscribe, share the messages. It's the only way this channel is going to grow is if you share what I have to say today. And this channel is all about uh, talking about what's going on in the world and then responding to that from a biblical worldview. What does the Bible have to say in the times we're living in? That's exactly what this is about. I'm not going to make uh, any extreme claims. This isn't uh, you know, any kind of cult. It's just a. I believe the Bible is the authority in which we should be living by. And we've gotten way far away from that. So anyway, today I found this nice little collection put together by Bold as a Lion Ministries. So I'm not claiming credit for the material, but I am claiming credit for the compilation of this material with the videos and the slides and my wonderful voice. So anyway, I hope you stay tuned. Please uh, support this channel by um, clicking down on our sponsors and buying some of their wonderful products. They're nutritional supplements that everybody needs, and especially in today's day and age, you need to be on top of your game. Stay healthy and stay strong and uh, you will stay alive longer. Okay, so here's, let's just get right down to it. I'm gonna show you some slides just for uh, visual aid, but this is what we're talking about, sexual immorality, and according to the KJV, they don't use the word sexual immorality, not once. The word they use is fornication. So, you know, sometimes it's good to learn new words. Fornication is the old school word, and maybe I'm bringing it back, maybe I'm just a little old school. But that's the word used. If you want to look up uh, fornication in the KJV Bible, you will find every verse that talks about any kind of sexual immorality. And that has to do with lots of different kinds. Um, and the Bible's transparent in that it shows the character's flaws. It does not make the characters in the Bible perfect by any means, except for Jesus, of course. And he got crucified. So if we were going to make a perfect character... He probably, if it was a man's creation, it probably wouldn't have ended in his crucifixion. But he did rise from the dead on the third day. That's why we celebrate. And if he did not do that, our faith would be in vain. All right, so what are the effects of sexual immorality or fornication on our society? Well, in order to really discuss that, we really got to go back in time. You know, people have been become obsessed. I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, nope. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm going to keep it on that screen for now. Learning new tech. People have become so obsessed with what makes them feel good that they are okay with compromising what is right and moral for the sake of satisfying their own appetite for pleasure. This led to practicing sexual immorality, or otherwise known as fornication, but not wanting to suffer the consequences. So, People began to look for ways to avoid these consequences, and the condom made way for people. By the way, this is not a conversation for children. So if you have children in the room, um, yeah, you may want to excuse them, pause the video. Uh, this is not for children. All right. So, of course, they began to look for ways to avoid the consequences to their actions of pleasure. Condom. Uh, made its way for people to practice sexual immorality or fornication safely. Quote, um, whatever your definition of safely might be, whatever theirs was. As condoms became easier to make and distribute, less accountability was required from the individual regarding fornication. It started with a rise in trying to prevent the consequences, namely STDs and unwanted pregnancies. STDs case cases were rising and people didn't want to have unplanned babies. So they tried to expand the use of contraceptives. The breakdown of the family began with the desire to not take responsibility for actions or for children. A monumental ideal. A desire to not have family. Isn't that remarkable? The vision was cast for not having children and the beginning of the de despise for children birthed from a desire to just have fun and play around. This isn't anything new. Mind you, they've been doing this, sacrificing babies to Moloch in the Old Testament, if you'll remember. This is an age-old satanic ritual, whether they realize it or not. 
uh, sacrificing their children so that they can continue having fun. Um, it's a very selfish motive, to say the least. And, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Sometimes I can understand the hard decision if a mother's life is at risk. However, I've also heard of stories where a mother's life was at risk, and she made the hard decision to have the baby anyway. And the baby survived, and the mother survived. They trusted God, and that was the result of that situation. I think sometimes doctors, they're not God, but sometimes they have to protect their own in order to continue in their business. They are a business. They are in the business of helping people. But at the same time, sometimes I think they twist people's arms uh, a little too much in the wrong, ungodly way. All right, well, let's look at the United States as an, of America as an example of this effect on society. Certainly, America is not the only example of how fornication has affected us. But that is my uh, point of reference. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. 1850s. Let's start with the 1850s. We're going to go way back. You know, this nation was born in the 1776, right? Even before that, when the pilgrims came over, fighting for, you know, escaping so that they could celebrate religious freedom, freedom from persecution, freedom to celebrate and express their religious freedom. Well, we're kind of skipping forward a little bit to recent history, 1850s. By the 1850s, uh, according to this research, sex education was introduced in public schools to inform students about sexually transmitted diseases and how they are spread. This new area of curriculum came in response, and I don't know how, how predominant the public education system really was at that time. Um, you see an example of a classroom here. Um, you have like two to three to four different grade levels in the same room so you have uh, I, I don't know how you do a sex education in that kind of classroom It's probably more for older kids I would think but you know they're teaching kids younger and younger these days so just want to give you that uh, picture of what school might have been like back then but the new area of curriculum came in response to the rising STDs rates uh, rising STD rates in America although increased education was important Abstinence was taught as the sole method for preventing disease. Abstinence is the idea of not having sex with anyone. Okay? Not a very common idea today, but abstinence is what they used to teach. And the stigma for individuals with an STD remaining so strong that many were refused treatment even by hospitals. Think about that. Would a hospital turn somebody away for having an STD today? Certainly not, but back then, that's how bad the stigma was. Okay, by the 1900s, let's see if I can do this. There we go. A little different. <laughs> These old photos always entertain me. Uh, they're some of the kids' expressions, but if you just imagine yourself being in that picture. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, condoms were the most popular form of birth control, according to this research. I don't know if that really was. I think abstinence probably was, but... Uh, According to this research, um, it, as far as Europe and North America is concerned. Now, by 1914, see that what is that on that guy's face? Well, during World War I, America saw 400,000 cases of syphilis. They did not st standard issue condoms, and we're talking about the military at this time. So, yeah. So syphilis was one of the STDs running rampant at that time. In the night, so, and these are some of the educational material given back in that day. I don't know if you can see that. Let me take myself out of the picture here. Well, there we go. So, yeah, booby trap syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of funny, right? Anyway. Um, yep, there we go. And then here's some other material. This guy's like, I let them all down. What a sucker I've been. He brought vene venereal disease ward. He let everybody down. That was kind of the m mindset that put out some material. A moment of pleasure for a lifetime of regret. Yep, that's right. Okay, that's not what I wanted to show. Okay. 
And then here's one uh, leading up to World War II a little later. Fool the Axis, use prophylactics. I mean, can you imagine if that kind of propaganda was used today to get, to, to use for, uh, you know, birth control? And here's three treatments, 62, I don't know if that's grams each. A doughboy, prophylactic. Now this stuff, this mercury stuff, uh, later they found out that that stuff actually caused mercury poisoning. So, our... <laughs> Uh, sad to say, um, that's uh, not used anymore. Uh, but that probably affected some people in, in some really more negative ways than just, um, you know, birth control. All right. 1920s. I just put some pictures here to kind of remind you of all the things that happened during the 20s. You know, you got stock market going crazy. You got the flappers, the women's rights, and... Uh, and, and alcohol prohibition, you know, you had clubs, uh, uh, you know, um, prohibiting alcohol, uh, anyway. But in the 1920s, condom sales supposedly doubled as advertised as a way to prevent STDs. Again, s sin without consequences. Now we jump to the 1930s. Let's see here, there we go. In the 1930s, it was legal to advertise condoms. Kind of strange um, to think that it might not have been. In the 1940s, STDs saw a decline until the Hayes Code, uh, which was a production code for movies, uh, which monitored commercial television to uh, establish some sort of moral standards. This code was abandoned in 1967. So we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll look at some of the statistics of that. So at this time in the 30s, the Hayes Code was monitoring TV commercials to limit immoral things being put on there. Okay, so there was kind of like a watchdog over the, you know, like the FCC or something. But uh, so we have the 30s uh, with condoms being promoted and STDs drawing down a little bit. And then we get to the 1950s. There we go. I don't know if I, I can't change that, but anyway, it's another picture of a uh, chemical prophylactic that was issued to soldiers. Man, uh, kind of crazy, but that's something that actually happened. In the 1950s, during World War II, condoms were standard issue for the military, but STDs made a significant comeback during these years. 1953, and I, I hate to even mention this because it's, it's such a shame to our country, the pornography that he produced over the years, but Hugh Hefner, in 1953, founder of Playboy, issues its first magazine in December. Just another way of indulging in sexual immorality, but trying to avoid the consequences. Now, I can't imagine how many uh, women were sexually assaulted over the years at that uh, uh, dismal place he calls uh, whatever it was. Yeah. All right, let's skip forward. Um, so less responsibility leads to bad parenting or lack of parenting. Thus, we begin the dissolving of the family structure and the decline of our nation. There was a dramatic increase in single-parent families in the United States in the last three decades of the 20th century. Despite all of these actions towards a planned parenthood, in actuality, in our effort to prevent the consequences, we actually began breeding bigger consequences unseen. The breakdown of the family resulting in the breakdown of our society and casting off all restraint. Flash forward to the 1960s, the evolution of birth control. Did you know that birth control pills were officially approved for the FDA in 1960? Yeah. And here's the Hayes Code principle. It was actually uh, repealed in 1967. That tells you a little bit what that's about. No picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. Okay. So there's some interesting things. They repealed that. So, All right. With the introduction of the pill it, in 1960, it revolutionized birth control, and it led to what may be referred to as the sexual revolution of the 1960s. The pill quickly became the most popular form of birth control, followed by condoms. Now think about it. If you can have sex, if a woman can have sex taking these pills without the consequence of having a child, well, someone who wants to have sex is going to be less restrained to have uh, you know to have more sex to be more promiscuous and to have more fornication 
1965, the divorce rate was 2.5 per 1,000 people, just to give you a baseline. Um, that has been increasing uh, before that, but in only about 1 in 10 adults ages 25 and older, about 9% in that age range, had never been married. By 2012, this increased to 20%, so more than doubled from uh, 1965 to 19 or 2012. So the number of people that had never been married doubled, and it's probably more than that now. Um, 1967, of course, the Hayes Code of Hollywood was abandoned. Okay. All right, 1970s. This was a key decade as well. 1973, the Roe versus Wade decision. In the 1970s, 13% of families were headed by a single parent in 1970. 13% of families. Think about that. More than 1 in 10 um, families had a single parent. Unmarried women in the United States accounted for nearly 1 in 10 ratio uh, births in 1970. In 1973, Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in the United States. This allowed abortion on demand up to 24 to 28 weeks. I mean, a baby could be delivered and live at uh, even 22 weeks, I've heard of. Um, they need a lot of NICU time, uh, but uh, they can be viable at 22 weeks. They can survive. And they were allowing abortion. And even some states today are allowing abortion right up to the term. It's sick. It's murder. And uh, if you've had an abortion, man, God can forgive you, but uh, do, don't do that anymore. Like, let's put a stop to this. This is not what God wanted. Women have 14th Amendment right to privacy. That was their argument, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And the, they were saying that the federal law supersedes patchwork state laws. And by patchwork state laws, meaning that different states had different laws regarding abortion. So now they just made it legal nationwide and superseded all the states. And this was the justice that authored the majority decision. Okay. All right. 1980s. A lot of stuff happened in the 1980s. Um, namely, it was the discovery of AIDS. You know who was really big on the research of AIDS? Dr. Fauci. Yeah, the one that's uh, kind of running up this uh, COVID business in in our nation right now um, giving all kinds of advice and then going back on it it's kind of interesting anyway aids death since 1987 you kind of see the numbers here goes down from uh, 13,000 when they actually started taking reliable numbers all the way up to the peak it looks like in 1940 i'm sorry 1995 i believe it was 1995 a total of 41,000 a year and after that, the numbers dramatically decreased. Now, I also want to say that throughout the world, in re more recent maps of where AIDS is really taking a toll, it's in the South Africa continent. I mean, the, the southern continent of Africa is just riddled with AIDS. It is out of control. I mean, people need to turn to God. They need, they need help. I mean, this is rampant down there. But up here, it's decreased quite a bit. All right, with that, I also want to lead to the next slide. It is the divorces. You know, in the 80s, divorce rates were increasing to an all-time high of 5 per 1,000 by 1985. And, uh, yeah, let's see. Let me see. And it was, yeah, I mean, it steadily started decreasing, you know, thank God, but that's also because people are getting married less. So it's really hard to tell um, these rates exactly what it means. But if people are getting married less and they're getting divorced less, well, it could be that the people that are getting married are getting divorced more. And you're going to have to see that trend line a little bit more. So, my Reese's Pieces, they are not a sponsor of this video. Okay. Imagine you probably hear me crunching on that. Okay, sorry about that. Had to hit my craving. All right, now we're going to the 1990s. 90s, abortion peaked with 1.6 billion, I'm sorry, scratch that, 1.6 million babies killed in the womb by abortion. Okay, here's the rise and fall. The red line 
is the abortion rate. The blue line is the birth rate. So as the birth rate was kind of at a peak here in 1969, 1970, the birth rate started dropping and the abortion rate was increasing. You see the correlation there. These two time periods completely sync up. Birth rate goes down as abortion rates come up. There's a direct relationship between abortions and birth rate. Okay. Just want you to see that with your own eyes. I'm a visual person. I, I imagine there's people out there that are too. Over one-fourth of the children in the United States lived with single parent in 1996, double the proportion of 1970. Divorce rates declined to 4.4 per 1,000. Let's see, is that my next... Uh, I thought I had divorce on here. Oh, I do want to talk about this slide. Annual abortion since... I mean, you thought that 90s were bad. I mean, I couldn't find a chart that just totaled it all. But if we had a running total, I mean, it would be exponential. It just keeps going up and up and up. Like if we had a chart like the COVID numbers that were just accounts for total deaths. What if they did that for abortion? Total deaths. We need to get that curve. <laughs> we need to slow the curve of abortion, right? It's an atrocity. I mean, just because the curve is going down, we're still seeing babies slaughtered. This is, this is good that it's going down, but it's not good enough. There should be zero I mean, the, what year is this? 1970? There was just, I mean, way, way less than there are now. Still, abortion is just really through the roof. It's crazy. Um, something else that happened in the 90s was the World Wide Web protocols were finished. First web page was created. Um, 1995 is often considered the first year the web became commercialized. While there were commercial enterprises, the reason I mentioned the web, this is where pleasure without consequence takes off in the form of pornography, okay? And that is a form of fornication. Fornication is simply sex outside of marriage. Any kind of immoral sex, that's why we call it sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage, I mean, this, this is part of that. Um, the internet has put more uh, pornography in the screens and on the phones of kids than than ever in the history of mankind and it's causing them all kinds of problems i want to show you here in a second psychological problems relationship problems marriage problems here we go there we go and here's the divorce rate i don't know if you can see all those numbers but the number of divorces in the united states between 1960 and 2015 has gone up in 1995, you can kind of see where it started trickling off a little bit, but that's also because the number of marriages has decreased. Like the number of single people that have never been married are actually increasing. So that could, we don't really know the total effect of that on the numbers. Okay. All right. And let's, let's go to the, uh, before we get to the 2000s, Everybody knows the word Google. It's a search engine, right, that w just dominates um, and, and tracks you and makes you a commercial item by selling your information. Okay, they were created in 1998. So the birth of Google, I mean, they help people get to porn. Let's just say what it is, okay? All right, they could block it if they wanted to, right? They got uh, algorithms and ways to manipulate search engines. They sure as hell, excuse me, could end the search for people finding porn. But do they? I doubt it. I haven't heard anything to that effect. Okay, 2000s. In 2003, Skype is released to the public, giving a user-friendly interface to voice over IP calling. You probably have done a lot of voice over IP calling with uh, Skype or Zoom this last year, uh, with everybody going virtual. Uh, MySpace was created as social, you know, social uh, websites get increased. You get Twitter, you got MySpace, you got Facebook, okay? And uh, Facebook became a less perverse alternative and even outlived MySpace. I don't know if any of you remember MySpace, but I do. <laughs> there are over 68 million daily searches for pornography in the United States. Did you realize that? 68 million daily searches for pornography in the United States. That's 25% of all daily searches. 
So a quarter of all searches are for pornography. You believe that one out of four searching for pornography. 10% of adults admit to having an addiction to online pornography as of 2006. Children as young as 11 are regularly accessing hardcore pornography, according to some surveys. And following first exposure, the largest consumer group of internet pornography is boys between the ages of 12 and 17. And then in 2007, out came the iPhone and the mobile web, putting pornography right in the hands of teens. I want to show you this because look at the countries and the amount of porn by percentage by each country. It's such a small percentage. Germany only has 4% of the world's porn. UK, only 3% of the world's porn. Look at the United States, 89%. That is embarrassing. Can we do something about that? Can't we destroy some of these Pornhub sites and get rid of it? You know, maybe God would send them a virus, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, so we've seen the 2000s. Um, a lot of stuff happened. Let's look at 2010s really quickly. I've got a bunch of numbers I'm just throwing up there on that collage. But let me talk through this a little bit. The sex industry is the largest, most profitable industry in the world. It includes street prostitution, brothels, massage parlors, strip clubs, human trafficking for sexual purposes, phone sex, child and adult pornography, mail order brides, sex tourism, just to mention a few of the most common examples, according to a survey in 2013. Sex industry is more than just one or two of the things you maybe normally think of. It's all that. In 2010... 13% of global web searches were for sexual content. And it does not include P2P downloads and torrents. Okay. Um, you know how I was saying that uh, there's over 68 million daily searches in the 2000s for pornography? Well, in the 2010s, there's over 1.68 million visits per hour to one porn website that I won't mention. 1.68 million visits per hour. That is absurd. Okay. Globally, teen is the most searched term. A Google Trends analysis indicates the search for teen porn have more than tripled between 2005 and 2013, and teen porn was the fastest growing genre over this period. Total searches for teen related porn reached an estimated 500,000 daily in March 2013 for larger than far larger than other genres, representing approximately one-third of total daily searches for pornographic websites. And might I say, teen porn is child porn, okay? You, you can't make it nice and say, oh, that's a nice young lady or a young man. No, it's, it's a child. That's child porn that people are looking at, okay? All right, what else we got? This hole goes so deep. Um... The United States is by far the top producer of pornographic DVDs, web material. Second largest is Germany. They each produce in excess of 400 porn films for every... For, huh, I can't even say this. They each produce in excess of 400 porn films for every DVD every week. I don't know what that means. It's absurd. Anyway, I, I, I'm sorry I'm having to make you think of this. Uh, it's 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 indecent. It should not even be mentioned out of my mouth. But this is the reality in the world in which we live. What does the Bible have to say about that? I haven't even got there yet. But many studies have reported various findings, but across the board it's been found that women watch less porn than men. I don't know if that's true anymore, but let's look at what the stats say. Okay. Um, in 2012, let's see. Yeah, we're still in 2012s. In 2012, one in five adults, ages 25 and older, about 42 million people, had never been married, according to a new Pew Research Center analysis of census data. In 1960, only about one in 10 adults, 9%, that had never been married. I think I already mentioned that. Just kind of a, now we're on the other side of that statistic. Okay, now I want to talk about divorce rates. You know, I kind of already mentioned this slide, but I think the porn increase if you if you look through these numbers right you know through the 90s as porn's increasing <laughs> divorce 
uh, marriage rates going down, divorce rates still, think about it, there's still a lot of people getting divorced. This is still a lot. 900,000 every year? I mean, marriages, let's get it together. The U.S. divorce rate steadily and dramatically increased in thirty in the 30-year period, 1965 to 1995, as you can see. However, the amount of people actually getting married severely decreased, so the divorce rate hits a plateau at a certain point and can't accurately depict a good illustration of how the family structure is being torn apart. In fact, it just simply isn't there. The United States has one of the highest divorce rates in the world, twice that of Denmark, Canada, or the United Kingdom. If you didn't know that, nobody else in the world is getting divorced as much as you here in the United States, okay? It is, it is not normal. It should not be normal. Don't think it's okay. Don't think it's normal. Let's get some marriage counseling before we get a divorce. Let's work on this. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is why do abortions occur? You know, we're kind of talking about sexual immorality, but let's talk about why abortions occur. On average, women give at least three reasons when interviewed about why they choose abortion. 75% say that having a baby would interfere with work, school, or other responsibilities. 75% say they cannot afford a child. 50% say they do not want to be a single parent or are having problems with their husband or partner. 12% of women included a physical problem with their health among reasons for having an abortion and only one percent of aborting women reported that they were the survivors of rape since 1973 58 million babies have been aborted in the united states and i think that number is probably even higher as of this year um just a note on this from a biblical perspective when when you say if someone was to tell me that having a baby would interfere with work school or other responsibilities well no joke you know maybe uh, we should just deal with the consequences of our actions and if we're gonna have a baby if we're gonna have the fun of making a baby well you should you know take care of that baby and care for it and uh, stop being so selfish you know uh, life's not all about you. Um, it's actually about serving others, and that includes children sometimes. 75% say they cannot afford a child. Well, yeah, children are expensive. But I, I will tell you this. In my life, when we've had new children, uh, it seems like my salary <laughs> has increased with each child. You want to look at that as God taking care of my children through giving me an increased salary? Or if you want to look at that as, oh, I freaked out and I got a better job. Well, that's not always possible, you know. Um, sometimes those kinds of things are a little bit out of your control, and, and sometimes it is. I believe, though, that if you're doing the right thing, if, if you're doing the best you know to do the right thing, the Bible actually has something to do that. There's a psalm that says... Um, and forgive me if I misquote it, but it says, I've never seen the child of the righteous go hungry or begging for bread. That's a really powerful promise. If you can live by that, and, and I will say, there's been a few times I've had to knuckle down and go to a food pantry. Times were a little tough. My kids never went without, though. They never went without. Okay. So that's just my testimony to you. Um, I hope that encourages you that, uh, yeah, you may not think you can afford a child, but you have nine months to prepare. Okay, It's plenty of time to get a better job. It's plenty of time to get another job, work multiple jobs. There's been times when I've had three jobs to be able to take care of those children. If you're willing to work, there's work out there to be had. And women, I, 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 I can't, I know it's got to be hard for women especially if you're a single parent. I can't imagine. I see the way my wife struggles, and I can't imagine the way a single parent will struggle. That's why it's so important to tell these young ladies, young ladies, if you are having uh, sex outside of marriage, you have, you have to stop. Save sex for after marriage. And men too, save sex for after marriage. 
children should be had inside the marriage uh, safety realm, the safety net of marriage. I mean, it is protection not only for the woman, it's also protection for the children. And it's a safety net for the man to have a woman that's faithful to him in that sense, okay? It's good for everybody to have a family that's faithful to each other. All right, let's look at the statistics on the effect of pornography, because this all ties together. If you think about it, pornography, abortion, divorce, they're all connected. They all affect one another. That's why we're talking about all these. So studies show that after viewing pornography, men are more likely to report decreased empathy for rape victims. I don't know what that's about, and I can't explain that. Um, have increasingly aggressive behavioral tendencies. Okay? Report believing that a woman who dresses provocatively deserves to be raped. Okay? Wow. I can't believe they would say that, but uh, apparently they're more likely to. That's just what the stats prove. Not that it's right. Report. They're more likely to report anger at women who flirt, but then refuse to have sex. Report decreased sexual interest in their girlfriend or wives. Did you know that? Yeah, that's not a good impact on a relationship. Hopefully it's not your girlfriend that you're trying to have sex with. Hopefully it's your wife. And then uh, they're more likely to report increased interest in coercing partners into unwanted sexual acts. So, you know, pornography is really not good for relationships. And here's just, that's just a few reasons why. Okay. All right. Let's see. The next slide is fatherless homes breed violence. You know, the tearing apart of the family is affecting the next generation. It's affecting... All this, okay? Fatherless homes breed violence. According to getting, getting Men Involved, the newsletter of the Bay Area Male Involvement Network of the spring 1997, 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes as well. 85% of children that exhibit behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists motivi motivated with Displaced anger come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. You see a pattern here. It's really important that fathers are present in their children's lives. Um, you could be an absentee father. You could still be at home, live at home, but never interact with your kid. Um, that's really no different than any of these fatherless home statistics. You need to be present. You need to be active. And that is hard. As a father myself, sometimes that is extremely hard to know how to be positively engaged in your children's lives. But it's going to take work. And maybe maybe you need to see a counselor. Maybe, you know, there's family therapists out there that can really help you work through some things. As a third party, um, they can help you work through maybe some heated topics that need to be uh, helped with. All right, so some of those other statistics, 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 70% of all juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. And I want to talk about that for a second because I worked in a state-operated, uh, let's say county-operated um, institution. Um, juvenile detention is what it was. And I polled them myself. I'm like, how many of you, uh, you know, your father's either working all the time not there, divorced, you know, not present in your life. And I think everybody, but maybe one. In fact, I think everybody out of 15 to 20 kids raised their hands. It's a pretty high percentage point. So it, it, it's likely higher than 70% in some cases. And, you know, they were all there. Not necessarily as the fatherless situation's fault. They made some poor decisions. They didn't have a father there to be a, a good role model in their life of how to be a man. They're growing up, they don't have any restraint. You know, a mother can only do so much. You know, you, you as a mother, you're limited in how much parenting you can do. It, it's just, and, and if you're a single father, it's the same thing. You're limited in how much parenting you can do. Um, okay, 85% of all youths sitting in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Okay, so that, that's some astounding statistics. The, the attack on the family is real, and it has put our country in the situation we're in now. Understand, biblical values need to be reinstituted and re-implemented in our communities. Okay, and here's some more. 
um, because only a proportion of each age group grew up in a fatherless home, these statistics translate to mean that children from fatherless homes are five times more likely to commit suicide, 32 times more likely to run away, 20 times more likely to behave, have behavioral disorders, 14 times more likely to commit rape, 9 times more likely to drop out of high school, 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substances, 9 times more likely to end up in state-operated institution, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Look, that's all I've got for you today. Look, uh, please subscribe, share, comment. Uh, love to hear your comments, prayer requests. Please um, help support this channel by help support this channel by uh, going to our sponsors page, buying some of their awesome products, and uh, kicking back some of that to support this channel. Need your support to keep it going, and uh, yeah. This message needs to get out. Our nation, our youth, our people need to hear this message. If we don't know where we've been, then we sure don't know where we're going. And we as a nation need to be aware of this so we can change the direction we're going, go in a better direction, have some moral standards, understand the biblical principle against fornication and the confines. Here, here's what the Bible says. The Bible gives an example of... The intention of marriage by God is one man, one woman in marriage for life. Yes, there were examples of like Abraham, who his wife gave him his handmaiden to sleep with because he didn't have any children yet. And so he had a child through her, Hagar. That was not God's intention. God's intention was, you know, the Bible's clear in the fact that it makes its characters, its people transparent in their flaws. It doesn't cover them up. It doesn't hide their flaws. It shows them. They're people, they're sinners, and they're saved by grace. Abraham was not perfect. Um, Joseph was not perfect. David was not perfect. David sinned with Bathsheba. You know, his biggest sin was not... I'm just reiterating the story. He looked at a woman bathing, and instead of turning his eyes away from that evil, he said, hey, go get me that woman. Who is that? Bring her to me. <laughs> um, he was a player. And, and that's not a good thing. That is evil. Pure evil. And it is the destruction of the human family. You can't have uh, a fatherly love for children that when you're just playing the field all the time like that. You can't take care of your own and grow a godly, wholesome family when you're playing the field like that. So, look. God has an intention of one man, one woman, together for life. It taking care of a family, and out of that, you're giving your kids the moral codes in which they need to grow up in, and as a result, they're putting those morals into the guarding themselves from immorality. They're not letting their eyes, as in some of these statistics, seeing porn for the first time at 11 years old. They're not being sexually assaulted because we're guarding them, we're protecting them, we're present in their lives, we're not letting other people abuse them. God forbid some things happen in places we trust, and, and, and it shouldn't happen like that. But if we have fathers involved, that's going to happen a lot less, I promise you. So it's not just an assault on fathers, but this is fornication is what I'm attacking here. Fornication is what needs to be attacked. Sex inside of marriage, the Bible says, is holy. Sex within the marriage bed is good, is pure. So get married, have lots of sex, have lots of babies, and don't get divorced. Don't look at porn because it ruins your relationships. Don't get divorced. I hope this message was a blessing to you. This certainly wasn't for children. Um, leave your comments. Uh, maybe there's some things I said that uh, uh, maybe I need to adjust a little bit better. Help me out with that if you want to. And uh, please support this channel by visiting our sponsors. Take care. God bless. See you next time.